I'm Tarun Basu from the Society for Policy Studies, SPS. COVID-19 is going to change the world as we know it from, for, for quite, quite some time to come. Every area of human activity and human engagement is likely to be affected. And one area that is going to be disrupted like no other is education. The future of our children, in a way, the future of human civilization. According to UNESCO figures, 1.5 billion students spread across 188 countries with 60 million teachers are at present sitting at home because these schools across the world are shut. What is going to be their future? In India, 3 million, 120 million students are affected, or what we call learners. About 35 million of them were the, are who go, are going for higher education, many of them abroad. According to the figures of the Ministry of External Affairs, 750,000 students, Indian students, were studying in foreign universities across the world. The top three destinations being USA, Canada, and Australia. To talk about the effect of COVID-19 on education, we have here with us today Ambassador Amit Dasgupta, a former Indian envoy to several countries, author, educator, who's currently the country director of the UNSW Sydney, the University of New South Wales, one of the world's top universities. Ambassador Dasgupta, welcome to Conversations. Thank you, sir. Ambassador Dasgupta, very simple question. How do you see COVID-19 affecting the future of education? And what do you, how do you see the outlook for the months and years to come in the terms of the disruption it is going to entail? In education, in examination, in syllabus, everything. So in my view, Tarun, actually the impact um, is gonna be a very positive one. And uh, I say positive because what it's going to make us do is that it's gonna make us leapfrog uh, because the new normal is now being discovered. Education is going to move from traditional modes of teaching and learning that people like you and I grew up in. Pe people in fact who grew up just a few months ago uh, in sprawling big campuses, face-to-face -face classrooms, uh, interaction with teachers again on a face-to-face -face basis interaction with peers and uh, uh, students uh, studying together, doing projects together, again face to face, all of that is going to be dramatically disrupted. I believe what's going to happen is that online education, blended learning models are going to increasingly come to the fore. And this is not a bad thing at all because that is one forum where technology would be used to actually increase the footprint of the number of people you can impact and the number of people you can reach. So my take on COVID-19 is that while it has disrupted, while it has caused chaos, indeed havoc across the globe, and this is not just restricted to China or to Australia or to France and Italy, it's really the impact that one needs to look at in terms of, all right, it's confusing. All right, it's caused a lot of damage. But I think you sit back, look at it carefully, and ask yourself, can I think laterally? What can I get out of this which is going to be to our advantage? Because at the end of the day, you cannot write off the importance of education. Education has to be delivered. People have to be taught what is going to be the next normal in the way you deliver pedagogy. I think that is the critical question. Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, scenario that you have painted. But switching from the traditional methods of learning to digital learning, especially in countries like ours, which is really not that digitally empowered, is going to take a lot of effort, a lot of investment, and a lot of work. Can that be done overnight? What is the future of our children who are in the middle, in a transitional phase, who are, don't even know the outcomes of their exams, who don't even know when the new, ex, new, uh, new 
academic years are going to start, where they are going to go, which countries are open for uh, business, which countries are not. I mean, I feel sorry for their parents who have to plan so many things and, you know, and there is nothing clear. How can it be done in a, can it be done in a phased or in a smooth manner? Can this be done in a phased or a smooth manner? Look, I mean, I think, Tarun, I mean, as a former diplomat, I'd say that uh, when you have a crisis, when you have a full-blown crisis, like the one you have right now, what you need is a rapid response to that crisis. Uh, we don't currently have the luxury of delaying or staggering or, or finding a way where in a phased manner, we bring in innovation, change and disruption. Uh, in, in, in a matter of two or three weeks, I think UNSW has done something very dramatic. It's actually looking at how you can re-engage faculty and second, how you can re-engage with students. Looking at the fact that face-to-face -face is going to not be part of our game plan for a very long time to come. Do we write off all of 2020, therefore, and wait for face-to-face -to, -face to happen? I don't think so. We're already looking at delivering online education from the second term, which we call T2, which starts in June. And if required, if the situation does not improve, then even in T3, which is the September intake. But this also requires rewiring the way faculty is going to deal with the whole situation of online education. There are, of course, going to be some significant challenges. Some programs do require laboratory work, and that can't be delivered online. So I'd say this is a work in progress, but it's a work which is rapidly in progress because UNSW believes, and I think a lot of other international and national domestic education providers believe that Time is running out. We have a number of young people, this is our demographic dividend, sitting at home doing nothing. How do we engage with them? How do we engage with them in a qualitatively different manner? How do we engage with them so that they remain our demographic dividend? And what is it we need to do? Because at the end of the day, a nation's GDP depends significantly on its human capital. So that, that would be my response. You need a rapid response to this crisis. It cannot be a staggered and phased one over a long period of time. What may have taken 10 years is now gonna happen very quickly. We will move into online education and I think that's the game changer. So as the country director of the UNSW Sydney, what would your advice be to roughly 300,000 students and their parents who were planning to send their wards to abroad this year, a significant number of them perhaps to Australia and perhaps to UNSW. Look, I think, you know, everyone recognizes that this is, this is a unique crisis, but it is not unique in the sense that it's not country specific. It's impacting the entire globe. So students are not going to be allowed to, and I, I doubt if there's going to be a long queue outside the U.S. Embassy asking for uh, study visas. Many of this is, is, again, a disruption. So the manner in which we think has been dramatically overhauled. The, the advice that I can give to, to students and parents, I'd start off by saying that we never really thought about uh, online education. Indian students, uh, Indian parents looked at it uh, quite differently. They wanted the campus experience, uh, wanted sprawling grounds, meet other students, interact with them, sit with them in the library, and, and why not? And I think it's, it's part of our multicultural experience, which, which makes education so fundamentally important. After all, when you say globalized education, you're also talking about the cultural contact that you have with students from Vietnam, from China, from Somalia, from Japan. And, and, and this is what makes individuals more complete in my point of view. But this is not likely to happen. 
It's not likely to happen for some time. And I would see two kinds of reaction to online education. There would be a large cohort which would be quite happy to do it, provided that online education actually is a recognized certificate. You know, if, if you, you can attend a number of MOOCs programs today, but uh, it, it's only an appetizer, a kind of a taster. You know, it, you, you can't put it on your CV and say, here's a certificate which is recognized. But this is going to be different. Universities do recognize that a student wants that piece of paper which says that it is a recognized degree. So I think you're going to have an experience of students who, who look at online education as something that they are not going to be averse to. They will initially see it as a second best, uh, but I think gradually it's something that they would adjust to. You would have another very large group of kids who are not going to have the ability to, to, to have access to online education because of technology challenges. And there, I think the corporate sector, the government needs to step in because as Prime Minister of India said, it needs to be an education for all. If it has to be an education for all, there is a specific and a fundamental responsibility uh, to, to put in money, to upgrade technology, to ensure that all the young people aspiring for education have access to affordable education. So I would say the scenario is online education is going to be the flavor of the month. And if it's going to be the flavor of the month, then we need to make sure that everyone enjoys that flavor. Uh, Rasgupta, you know, the UNSW president and vice chancellor, Ian Jacob, I think in 2016 launched what I read about as the DIA initiative to attract about 100,000 students from India alone by 2025. In the light of this current crisis, where do all these targets stand? Not just for uh, universities like yours, but I guess universities from around the world. No, I think the DI initiative that uh, Professor Ian Jacobs uh, announced uh, was really how UNSW could partner with Indian academic institutions, with the government, with the corporate sector, to impact the lives of 100,000 students. We were not looking at 100,000 Indian students coming to study at UNSW, but how we could collaborate um, uh, with partner institutions in India institutions of academic excellence with, with the, the corporate sector and how this could transform lives. Because at the end of the day, what Professor Jacobs said was that great education is really the combination of the twin pillars of not only exceptional learning, but also exceptional research, but with a single objective in mind, transforming lives. And if you can transform lives of people, whether it's in the rural area through solar electrification, photovoltaics, we are actually a world leader. If you can transform lives through waste management, through water management, then, then I think you've done what education is expected to do. So I think that was the spirit behind the statement by Professor Ian Jacobs. And it is a statement that I am honored uh, to, to support and a statement that I believe uh, UNSW fully endorses. We need to transform lives. We need to start simply, humbly, uh, but we need to start. Uh, uh, we are facing one of the biggest public health crises that the world has seen in probably over a century. The UNSW had signed an agreement, if I remember correctly, with Medversity of the Apollo Hospitals Group to give public health degrees to people and so that empower Indians more and more to respond to public health challenges like this. Did that ever take shape? Is that working, that public health collaboration with adversity? Well, UNSW uh, has, has an extremely strong public health program and, 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 and indeed a program that a lot of Indian students uh, have been attracted to. They are uh, coming to UNSW Sydney for their master's um, on the subject. <coughs> I can um, 
introduce you at a later stage to, to some of the students who've come back. There's uh, Dr. Nikita Bhatwa, for example, uh, who is a medical practitioner, uh, did her program and is now back. She's in Bangalore and I, we, 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 can, we can connect with her uh, to find out how good the program was. I think what, what UNSW did was not just a collaboration with MedVarsity, but uh, was, is, is been looking at collaborations with multiple other agencies. One of the big institutions at UNSW, uh, uh, which is affiliated to UNSW, is the George Institute. And uh, they have been doing significant work, both in, particularly in the area of research on, on public health. Public health is a challenge, a requirement, is a, a necessity. That the government is, a, is a necessity, a challenge, and a requirement. And, and, and indeed something in which the government of India hadn't, or private institutions hadn't focused on much earlier. Uh, but I think what we are seeing now is collaboration with UNSW, collaboration with other institutions in building a strong cadre of public health specialists in India. Because the coronavirus is, is, is one health issue that we are facing, and God knows there could be more. And at that stage, you need a full-fledged cadre of public health specialists who can not only anticipate the coming of a problem, but also figure out how to deal with it. So I'd say this is, this is, a, this is a strong uh, uh, platform of collaboration between UNSW and institutions in India. Uh, that is so good to know, and that uh, augurs so good for the future of India's public health challenges. Ambassador Nasgupta, thank you so much. There's a lot of takeaway from this conversation and especially on the, the positive outlook that you have given to this whole thing when the future of education and pedagogy in particular was looking very bleak. Online education is the way to go. India is increasingly getting digitally empowered. We have to go to our, the new normal is online education, distant learning and the things. And I'm sure with the crisis upon us and with the emergency situations that we are facing in every sector, India and the South Asia and the rest of the world will be geared to the new challenges and universities like UNSW would be there to support our students and the students of this region in carving out a better future for themselves. Thank you so much. And maybe we should look at this issue in another couple of months again to see what changes have been brought about and where things have moved from here. Thank you again, Thank Ambassador Das Gupta. Thank you, thank you very much, Tarun. I just wanted to end by saying that UNSW has an India strategy, a strategy that it's committed to, a strategy that it will not abandon, because UNSW is here for the long haul, because that's what relationships are all about. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ambassador.